on to our introduction, uh, Dr. Rob Johns. He's a, a scientist with the uh, Atlantic Forestry Center in Fredericton, New Brunswick. And uh, is, uh, he joined the Canadian Forest Service in 2009. He's got a Bachelor of Science degree in uh, biology from St. Xavier in, uh, in New Brunswick and a PhD in biology at the University of New Brunswick. So today he's going to be speaking to us about harmonizing uh, spruce budworm management approaches in the Northeast. So I think a lot of the times when we Canadians are working on spruce budworm we, we tend to think of it as a Canada centric. And even within this map you can see it looks like Maine is part of the Atlantic. Um, I apologize for that. Um, sometimes we do forget that also Maine and a lot of the northeastern United States is also affected by spruce budworm. Um, the thing I would draw attention to on this, you know, even on the East Coast, we tend to think that this is just an issue out here, but there are times throughout Canada, probably at any given time, there's an outbreak of spruce budworm ongoing. And then we you get the 70s, we get this big mega outbreak. And so I, I, in the spirit of trying to, you know, we've had got a pretty big program ongoing in New Brunswick, uh, or in, in Eastern Canada, I should say. Um, it, it would be really great, and Brian and I have been, Brian Roth and Bob and I, we, and Barry Cook, and a lot of us have all been talking about trying to find ways that we can work better together to try to address this. There, you know, despite the map, there is a lot of con continuity between this, and there's a big area right here where um, I think we need to work together to make things uh, go forward. So uh, I'm going to take a step back, though. Uh, this is my eclectic mix of populations. Bruce Butterman even is a population issue. Uh, a lot of the things we see in the media, we see populations rising or spreading. That's for a good example is Ebola. Locusts that are outbreaking. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we have things like Atlantic cod that are declining, um, or at least are, are oscillating at really low levels. And we have some that are going extinct. But the fact is, when you look at real populations, what you tend to see is a fairly significant oscillation that tends to be bounded within limits of upper and lower limits. Uh, and this is the case for whether we're looking at an outbreak insect like pine looper, uh, whether we're looking at bulls, red grouse, snowshoes hares. There's difference perhaps in the magnitude of those oscillations, but the fact is there is these clear um, sort of uh, balancing between these upper and lower limits. And spruce butter was no different than this. Uh, here's some of the damage according to, from the Cape Breton Highlands. Um, many of you have seen defoliation that, uh, of spruce budworm, so this wouldn't be anything new. These characteristic red trees with the odd white influx there are trees that have been uh, killed. And if we look at spruce budworm compared against all of these other systems where we look at over time period, longer time periods, again, there's this oscillation. This is based on tree ring growth analysis. We have more recent, um, I believe this is also tree ring growth analysis, and then actually very specific measures of egg density or defoliation. And you see that there's a pretty strong periodicity to this. You know, roughly every 35 years we get these very relatively large outbreaks that occur. Um, and this basically, this is an older map, but you know, you can stretch this back and look into the paleoecological literature where you're looking for head capsules. They can find out evidence of this back, you know, up to 10,000 years. So this is not anything new, and not, not is not anything new, at least in eastern Canada. Um, and we're at the, the current beginning. I would say, although it is large, we're at the current beginning of an, out, an outbreak in eastern Canada. So it started around the Bay Camo area, uh, which is about here, in, 19, in 2006, and every year it's essentially doubled since then. As of 2014, this outbreak was about collectively 4.2 million hectares. Um, again, to put that in perspective, the last outbreak covered almost 55 million hectares, so we're still really at the early genesis of that. Um, it started here, but it started to spread into these patches around and these areas are starting to rise in these patches around there. We had this really weird one that's been just been festering over in Ontario for, throughout most of that time as well. And you can see right along the North Shore around 2011, we started to see the densities creeping up along the shore in the Ramoosk area. And as of now, we're about sort of 30 or 40 kilometers away from New Brunswick. Um, even when it was just sitting here at about 2 million hectares, our industry people down in New Brunswick were uh, starting to knock on our doors and ask us what we were going to do about this problem. And the answer to that is the same answer that has been there for the last 50 or so years. The strategic approach to managing spruce water typically has tied into what we understand about its population dynamics. Okay, so if we look at a single one of these cycles that we see for spruce budworm, there are certain things we need to know if we want to efficiently manage a spruce budworm outbreak. There's what is actually keeping those populations low in those long periods between outbreaks. What is it that causes this transition or this apparent release? 
where the populations go from this seemingly perpetual low density all of a sudden to this exponential growth that ends in, in coalesces and ends up in a very large outbreak over a large spatial scale. We want to know what happens to the populations, or what actually limits the populations at the top, what causes this sort of turnover where it comes back down, and what drives those populations into collapse and sort of sustained regulation at relatively low densities. Um, these parts we have a lot of information on. These parts we have very little. Part of that because usually by the time the research money shows up, it's probably about here. <laughs> um, so a lot, very little has actually been done in this up to the, up a, until this recent outbreak. Um, and it's really understanding, in particular, what goes on in these periods that helps us make decisions early on as the outbreak's rising and spreading of what we should do. So, I'm going to simplify the population ecology of this. Uh, there's really two elements that drive, can drive a population from a relatively low density to a rising population. The first is enhanced survival and reproduction, and this can be associated with you know, there's a lot of hypotheses that many of you probably know for spruce bummer could be associated with increases um, in the favorability of the environment that lead to higher survival. Uh, alternatively, it could be associated with the declines in, uh, in parasitism or predation, things that typically keep the populations low. The alternative one that's been discussed quite a bit for spruce bummer is, of course, immigration. Now, this doesn't necessarily explain why that first seed appears. That's probably, the, the, it, there could be a lot of things associated with that, but at least in terms of populations rising and seemingly to spread around the area, immigration can contribute individuals to populations that would otherwise <coughs> remain low. And it's really these two topics uh, for the last 50 years that our, our scientists have been debating. And there, so there's two main hypotheses associated with those factors that explain, you know, that have sort of driven the conversation of how, uh, of how populations rise and fall and um, how those two factors contribute to it. The first is, this is the oscillatory hypothesis. This is the one that was put forth um, by Tom Ram in the 1970s and 80s. Um, this was a replacement of what was called the double equilibrium theory, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but the oscillatory hypothesis was basically arguing for a strong cycle of spruce bugworm. Early hypothesis just talked about it being bounded and just bouncing within these limits based on the carrying capacity. Um, this hypothesis argued for sort of an os oscillation that was driven primarily by predator-prey interactions. So you had populations rise, and the natural enemies would catch up to it, they would pull those populations down when the populations were really low. Eventually, there was not enough resources for the natural enemies. Those natural enemies would essentially collapse, and this would cause the release of spruce bubble that would allow it to rise. Oops. So they were basically arguing for this really complex predator-prey interaction, and the mechanism of release in this hypothesis was that the predator population basically dropped to the point that it released or allowed the release of the spruce butter populations. Um, in terms of immigration, Tom and his colleagues uh, argued that immigration didn't significantly contribute to the rise or spread of populations. What it essentially did was it just evened out populations in that area. What they're basically arguing for here for is that it's not this illusion of these hot spots popping up. What you actually have is a syn synchronous rise of those populations in that area, and these areas that appear to be hot spots are actually just the illusion of particularly fast growing populations in those areas. That's the hypothesis that has driven a lot of our uh, management uh, strategies for the last 50 years. And essentially what this hypothesis argues for is what the so-called foliage protection strategy. Okay? The reason for this is if you're basically going out there, and you're not going to do anything in these low density populations. If you go out there, if this is the hypothesis, and you go out there and you treat relatively low population densities or hot spots to try to keep those populations low, um, you're essentially just going to uh, see the populations fill back in from the surrounding area because everything is rising up anyways. And that, that's basically the underlying premise for why we do a foliage protection strategy in Spruce Budworm. Instead, what they typically do in the foliage protection strategy is they wait till the density of defoliation gets relatively high. Uh, at least in, in uh, Quebec, and I think it might be the case in New Brunswick, to implement a foliage protection strategy requires two years of severe defoliation. Okay, after that, you're expecting to have significant effects on growth. Um, so two years of at least of severe defoliation, and you're basically just trying to keep foliage on those trees until the population collapses naturally. That's the foliage protection strategy. It's, it's really just a stopgap measure. 
And as I said, what you're basically doing is not unlike throwing a stone into the into the water into a lake or into a river. The water is basically going to fill right back in that space, and you'll never know you actually did anything in the first place. Um, one of the issues with this strategy, uh, at least as we enter present day, is whether we can afford something. At least to the, to the extent that we had during the previous outbreak. Um, I should. I, I'm not sure what the, the stats are for Maine, but I know at least for New Brunswick, they had 10 years during the previous outbreak of spraying half the province. I think that, I think it was about 200 million dollars, roughly, um, for 10 years of spray. Okay, this is in the 1980s. Um, 1950s, you know, we're looking at for the products, which was DDT at the time, about a buck a hectare. Present day, the only products uh, in Canada that are registered for spruce budworm, uh, Mimic, which is basically a hormonal analog. I can answer some questions about it, how it operates later. Um, BTK, which I know many of you are familiar with because a lot of it was developed here or tested here. Um, and potentially a pheromone, which they're used for mating disruption. Um, uh, but if you look at the cost, I mean, $45 for Mimic, it's almost a tenfold increase at least. BTK, $45 a hectare, at least in Quebec, they're often applying it twice to make sure that they get the efficacy that they need for foliage protection. Uh, the pheromone is a stunning $130 to $150 per hectare, so it's got to work to, to use that one. What's been going on since the last 30 years of when this oscillatory hypothesis first you know, sort of gained traction, there's been a lot of research. And where it's taken us surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly in science, is back towards one of the, at least in some ways, towards one of the original hypotheses, uh, hypotheses that was argued to drive spruce butter population dynamics. This is called the double equilibrium hypothesis. This was posited by a guy named uh, R.F. Morris. And they had a different, very different view of what was actually controlling populations, or what was actually driving these sort of these so-called cycles in spruce butter. Now, when it came to the natural survival reproduction, the association with natural enemies in particular, they were finding, they were arguing that there was an escape that was taking place where they were escaping from natural enemies, but it was not driven by the sort of relaxation of, nat of predators and, uh, predators and uh, parasitoids. Essentially what was happening was, you were at, they, they argued at least that there was a release associated with the seed and cone flushes or declines in stand quality. That was one of their explanations for it. But their main explanation for why, how these hot spot, how, or how the, this, these actually ended up being released, was it was driven by immigration from what they argued were in fact hot spots. Okay, so you have these areas of high density populations, and their argument was that these populations were spreading from that area. And what that basically looked like was this: you know, you have these times. This, this is sort of a very crude simulation of what's going on right now. Rather than having a broad population that's rising synchronously, you have these little pockets that pop up, such as the one in Bay Camo. They'll spread to some surrounding areas. Those expand and start to coalesce to some extent. They'll spread even more and become even more continuous, and eventually those end up in something that resembles those very large mega outbreaks that, we, that we've seen in these, during the last outbreak. In the last 20 years, we've had uh, quite a few tests ongoing to actually look at what's going on in this early population. We're still very confident that this part of the cycle is driven by natural enemies pushing things down. We've got a pile of, we, the Royal, we have a pile of evidence that shows that that is the case. But when we went out there, we tried to test some of those predictions of the oscillatory hypothesis for these early stages in experiments. There was two main pieces of evidence that pushed back against that. The first was that uh, Jacques, my colleague Jacques Renier has been, if you can imagine, monitoring uh, through sentinel larvae, where he basically put larvae out on trees uh, he's been monitoring parasitism in low density populations for the last 25 years, so basically since the last outbreak. And every year he goes out there and he puts these larvae out there, and he collects them and puts new larvae out there, and he sees whether or not they're parasitized. And the expectation for that, based on the oscillatory hypothesis, was that as you're approaching the newer outbreak, you should be seeing parasitism rates declining because you have decreases in those natural enemies. Every year for the last 25 years, he's at 99 to 100% parasitism. Even up to you know this year, it's the same thing. He's got basically this graph he shows with one additional data point every year. It basically looks like a flat line of parasitism of 100% right across the top. There's some changes in the composition of it, but it basically flatlines across the top. So that's one piece of evidence that is causing some of us or some of us to question at least the strength of the, the explanatory power of that oscillatory hypothesis for the rising population. Um, the other one was a paper they published in 2012. Um, where they're trying to look at uh, Ali effects, which is basically the lower, what's happening when, what's actually allowing these populations to be released in, you know, in, in very simplest terms. Um, 
And what they found was that there's a, what's called a mate finding allele effect. And what this means is that at really low population densities, the females really, really struggle to find mates. So if you have a low density population, that part of the reason why what keeps the populations low, aside from just natural enemies, is that the females are actually struggling to find mates. But you can see this really nice trend that as the populations get even over 10 per pheromone trap, as just as an example for density, you're starting to see significant increases in mating success of those females, you know, close to 80 to 100 percent. So there's these two, which so what that would what that would imply from that hypothesis is that migration from a hot spot, a particular of males, which we know to migrate a lot could lead to or contribute to those populations in surrounding areas increasing if mate finding is one of the issues that those low density populations are dealing with. The, uh, so those two pieces of evidence have started pushing us back to some hybrid modern synthesis that includes partial, at least for the rising populations, tenets of this double delivery <coughs> hypothesis. In particular, this idea that we have this epicentric spread of those populations. So if this is in fact the case, um, there are still ongoing tests, and the more sort of population data we collect on this, the stronger um, we seem to get, at least for the rising population, that this is um, at least a part of the population dynamics, this epicentric spread. Um, this gives us this idea of the so-called early intervention strategy, it's, which is essentially a population control strategy. And what we're basically, you try to do with this, is you try to deal with these, uh, you know, right now we're past the point where we can stop that first epicenter. But what we could do is manage along the perimeters of that outbreak as it's spreading to manage those populations and try to keep them below that threshold at which either they can escape the natural enemies or at which they have greater success finding mates. And the idea is essentially to target these outlying uh, hot spots or epicenters or whatever you want to call them uh, before those populations get hot. So in this strategy, you're actually targeting those low density populations. So, I mean, what this could look like, if you're trying to treat them below this threshold, you're basically knocking them down and keeping them below that. Whether that leads to the localized collapse or extinction, or whether you end up having to sort of retreat that every year or every few years, remains uncertain. But that's part of the project that's ongoing right now, is to try to understand whether we can actually make this, high, this, this work. Um, there are examples of this out there, although most of them are for, are for agricultural pests. The only example, which I'm sure you are, you guys are very familiar with, would be the gypsy moth example, the, the so-called slow the spread program. It's not unlike that. There is different biology associated with this insect, of course, but this, it's not unlike that. You can see here's an example uh, from a paper from 2007. You can see around the edge of the leading edge of this outbreak, uh, around the, in uh, Virginia, the leading edge of this outbreak. You can see these little patches that start to appear up there. Essentially, as you guys probably know. They go up there, and they basically treat this. And in doing so, they basically contribute to decreasing the spread of that population um, westward across the continent. So these different pieces were what were essentially drove, um, have been driving the conversation in Canada on spruce budworm for the last probably half, or probably decade or so. We've been having conversations about this. Um, and very recent, as of last, uh, early spring, our federal government, uh, unbeknownst to us, decided they were going to kick in $18 million to actually start to develop this program, or at least take a look to see to what extent it could contribute to this program for managing spruce budworm. So that, that was great, and, and then we were left with a task of actually, which was the same task that the gypsy moth folk had to deal with, was how do you actually translate all this really interesting population ecology theory into an actual management program? in such a way that you can actually test it. Um, and that's what, the, these are some of the pieces, at least some of the pieces that we're looking at for what we're developing. There's this idea of, you know, what is that threshold where we actually go in there and try to keep that population below that? A lot of the work Jacques Renier was doing up in Ramuski was associated with trying to figure out what that threshold would be. Um, there are several sources of evidence he has towards to select a density. It's probably context dependent, so we would with a grain of salt and we'll see how we do with it, but that density is roughly if you get more than eight larvae on a branch that we're working with, you're going to have a population that is not going to be able to be maintained uh, in a way, at least through probably some kind of population control strategy. Um, we're using, at least on our ongoing experimental program, we're using four larvae to be a little more conservative as an average across the area. Now what that does, what that means is 
That doesn't mean that everything in that area has to be below four larvae from branch. It just means that the average across the area that you're dealing with has to be below that. Of course, we need to know what kind of products we have, and we need to know whether these are actually contributing added a mortality to that population, or whether we're in. And that the products that we have at least available, I've alluded to, BTK mimic and perhaps pheromone. And that's a, well, I, I will say, by the way, that's probably all, it, as far as we see on the time horizon, that's probably all we are going to have available for this outbreak, at least in Canada. The one, the one of the huge challenges for this is actually defining and delineating what a hotspot actually is, or what an epicenter actually is. And to, of course, I, as I alluded to, to some extent this comes down to understanding migration. And there is a pile of work that's been done on migration. Some of you are familiar with Green Bank's extensive work he did back in the uh, 70s and 80s uh, during the previous outbreak. Really, really good work. Um, this is the migratory program, at least across Western <coughs> Canada. Um, and it looks like we include a name in this one. Um, where we basically have estimates of the density of spruce bugworm males, of course, because it's their own remote tropic across that area. So there's a lot of people that are working on migration of spruce bugworm. Um, this, this is a, I, I'm probably going to have to pass on. Uh, this, this is up in Ramuski. When the, the, these migratory events are significant, you know, uh, it's never been a question of whether spruce bugworm migrates. It's a question of how that, whether that, that migration is actually significant. And you can see here, this is up in Ramuski. There was a mass migration event across the St. Lawrence area. Uh, this was in 2010, I think this was taken, maybe 2011. And of course, they had to remove that with a front end loader. There's actually pictures through the archives of variations of this. Uh, when they get these mass flights, they're absolutely enormous. Um, but one of the curious things, when we actually took a shovel full of this and we started doing some processing of this, about 85% of these are males. Okay, which, I, so females are much less likely to disperse, at least based on what we found in these kind of areas. And that's a pretty consistent with the literature. And this takes us to a bit of a dilemma, though. We said, and this was the case also for, with this Ramuski, this mass migration event, when we started surveying around in that area. We often get these high captures of moths. This is from surveys from uh, in New Brunswick here. These are all the traps distributed throughout the province. Uh, we're getting six, seven hundred, eight hundred moths per trap up in these areas. We go back to those areas and we look for L2 larvae, which are an indi actual indication of that local population, and we can hardly find any at all. These black dots are all zeros, basically. The blues are kind of one, two, uh, really, really low density, and then we get these uh, occasional this, this year, this weird area where there's actually slightly more above you know, seven per branch in, in a couple plots. Um, so the point of this is just that just because we have these huge migration uh, or these, these huge apparent increases or large numbers of trap captures for males, it doesn't necessarily translate into uh, actual populations rising in that area, which just tells us that we really have a core understanding of migration. And so that was part of this project, was actually to try to get a better understanding of these migratory events. When do they actually mean anything? And when do they actually lead to populations sticking in an area, so to speak? Um, we had my, this, was done, this is a co-led with my, co my colleague uh, Deepa Piraswaran, who's uh, from the Great Lakes Forestry Center in Quebec City. Um, she was doing a lot of monitoring, trying to understand and characterize areas that constitute sources of moths, or hot sort of areas where you have higher in, in, like emigration of moths from those areas that are presumably moving down into at the direction of the outbreak spread right now, which is towards New Brunswick. I was working with my crew down in New Brunswick trying to figure out what these, how to characterize these areas where moths seem to stick in that area, trying to understand the mechanisms through which they actually end up establishing populations in these areas. And we're hoping over the course of this to be able to have some understanding of how we can make possibly some predictions about where or when these are going to come up. Um, I, I, I won't give you a full coverage of the data, but I will give you some of the sort of interesting quirks that we've seen from this data. Now, the difference between our pheromone trapping, and we we're also doing light trapping, by the way, but the difference between our trapping and what's typically done is we don't wait to the end of the season to collect the moss to just get an overall density of the moss. We actually want to get some phenological information, so some information on the timing of when the moths are doing things um, to better understand, uh, and, and I'll show you here what, what we can do with that kind of information. Um, so this is an example of one of Deepa's plots up in Quebec. Um, you can see relatively late phenology. We missed a little bit at the beginning, but basically you can see you have this sort of characteristic peak where the moths were busy, uh, you know, at the highest 
peak of uh, when they're up there, there's huge populations, you know, 1,400 moths caught at the peak for, in a day. Um, they're basically almost topping out some of their traps. There's so many moths that are capturing in the pheromone traps. But, you know, it's a characteristic kind of phenological curve where um, it peaks and then declines and you don't see anything after that. We shift down to Horn Gulch area, um, not far from the old Green River plots, for those of you familiar with them. Um, this is where I was doing some work. Um, again, the same thing, you can see the peak of it is a little bit earlier, it's a little bit warmer, so that's not surprising. Uh, but it's still, relatively speaking, a fairly nice peak with some, a bit of trickling towards the end. Um, what's interesting about this, you know, at our peak we're catching two, three hundred moths per trap. In this particular site, when I went back, because we were doing extensive population surveys, we found zero egg masses, we found zero L2 larvae, uh, just a pile of moths that were just coming into that area. So we can only, and there was also like building up to that point, there was no pupae in that site either. So we can only assume that this is probably represents to a large extent migrants coming either from surrounding areas that we missed, but more likely from the sort of Anhui area in Quebec where we've, we've had these, this outbreak sort of established in recent years. Then we move down to southern New Brunswick, around Moncton area. There's no populations down there. They're collecting no L2s in these areas. Um, you can see with this first peak, this would probably, this is very early, so that probably represents the local population really low, you know, eight larvae per trap, or eight, sorry, eight male moss per trap. But then we have this brief period of about 10 days. You know, the, the adults usually last, or at least the males have sort of five to six days that they're, they're active, usually no more than a week to my knowledge. Uh, and then we have this sort of gap period where we're catching nothing or very little. And then we have this weird secondary peak, which just happens to correspond pretty closely to when things were going up on in Quebec. So again, we have at least circumstantial evidence of a potential large scale, fairly long distance migratory event. Again, we find no L2 in those areas, no eggs. Um, and so the question remains, does this even mean anything if males are moving here? Particularly if you think about the at least the proposed mechanism of mate finding, all the females are done, and all the females are dead by this point. These males are showing up, and they're, you know, the door's already closed. It's too late. So these are sort of, sort of the questions we have. Now, how can we get better at understanding whether these are migrants or whether these are, you know, whether these are actually locals and how much they're contributing? Uh, there's other data we can get. You know, we have leg traps set up in a lot of these areas. We do know whether there's actually females that are migrating these long distance. We do know whether there's at least female activity in these areas, to some extent. Um, you have one of the other parts of the projects by one of my uh, collaborators, Patrick James, from uh, University of Montreal, is actually looking at not just the adult, but also the, the L2 that we can collect of the genomics in those areas. So we can actually look at the genetic, um, uh, genetic makeup of the different moths that we're collecting in these areas, and we can make, have some indications of whether they are closely, these ones are closely related to these, suggesting that this is just a sampling error on our part, or whether these are very different from these ones. Um, it would indicate that they're migrants. Not only that, over time, we can indicate whether these moths, presumably that are coming from Quebec, end up mixing with these groups, and we sort of see a shift in the genetic, uh, sort of genetic makeup of these populations locally. Um, so that's, that's some of the work that's ongoing with this. Um, part of the issue, I should say, this costs tens of thousands of dollars to do, uh, an enormous amount of time driving around the province. And Brunswick is not very big, but it's a, that's a very big loop when you're driving in the truck for day after day, trying to collect multiple times per week. So one of the things we tried to do this year is we wanted to get better spatial spread, but we also uh, wanted to try to see if we could get some of the, some citizen science to help us do some of these collections. Um, there's, there's sort of two sides to this project. The, of course, there's the science side where we've actually spread out. We're looking at about maybe 300 traps, which is versus the 40 traps we had this year. Um, we've got about, at least in eastern Canada, um, we've got in these areas, we've got about 150 so far, but we haven't even advertised or even really asked a lot of people yet. Um, when you offer a free, a free pheromone trap, people tend to be willing to take it. Um, and we've been talking to Charlene Donahue. She's been very, she's worked, basically was running already a citizen science program in Maine. Um, and so we just happen to sort of great minds think alike, I guess. And so we, uh, we've been talking about trying to coordinate some of that with, uh, with the main people as well. Uh, so this is one of our, our, at least one of our mechanisms through which we might get more data. The other part of this is, of course, is communication, as all citizen science uh, programs aim to do. Uh, this is part of, there's a lot of people in New Brunswick and Eastern Canada who have no idea what spruce bugworm is or have no concern, you know, no particular concern about it. 
they weren't here during the previous outbreak. So part of this is outreach just to start that conversation about what is potentially coming. So if we can, in fact, predict and monitor properly and establish the margins of what might be or might not be a hotspot or an epicenter, um, the other part is what do we actually do with that in, ter in, in terms of actually treating it? And that's the other part of the project that I, I'm co-leading with one, one of my collaborators, uh, Veronique Martel, also from the Lawrence Forestry Center. So this year, at least, when we went out to, uh, you know, this money came very early and we, were, we, we put together our project very quickly. And, and it, this, by the way, was before we had any kind of threshold. We, don't, we didn't know if we would have to treat these populations when there was one per branch or if it was 50 per branch. Or we assumed it was less than 50, but, um, but we didn't know what that, low, that, what that threshold was going to be. So we started very conservatively uh, in northwest New Brunswick in an area where we were finding sort of roughly 0.5 to 1 larvae per branch, really low populations, but we're consistently finding them around in these areas. You know, it's 70, 80 percent, or 60, 70 percent of the plots had larvae in them. Um, and what we did was we were going up there and testing one of the products that we had, in this case, what happened to be mimics. We set up control blocks and treatment blocks in these areas, um, and basically it did a fairly extensive surveys within each of these. Um, to look at whether we can have an impact. There's a couple things that we looked at in these plots. Um, the first one was just general population densities that we followed through time. Um, you can see in our controls, we started with uh, a total of 110 larvae over uh, 300 branches, roughly. Um, something like that. And you can see that, not surprisingly, this is characteristic of most invertebrates, in particular insects. Populations dropped, dropped, dropped. And by the time we got to the end of the season, over our 300 plus branches, we were actually, we sampled additional sample. We had almost 3,000 branches for eggs. We found three egg masses, which was not great for the morale of our crew. Uh, <laughs> three egg masses in our treatment sites. You can see after the mimic treatment, you know, we had, this, this wouldn't necessarily have registered that treatment, but basically we dropped down to zero. But, you know, what do you say from three egg masses versus zero egg masses? It's hard to pull too much from that. But um, we had sort of anticipated that it was going to be really difficult to do this sort of traditional, like, L4, L5, the before and after uh, spray, to see what was going to happen. And we were looking at, we were interested in looking at just generational survival rates. So, you know, those overwintering L2 in one generation, you have your spray program, and looking at them again in the fall to see what's actually still there. So if we look at it in terms of the L2 per branch, just in terms of density, we started off in our control blocks and in our treatment blocks with roughly you know, one every two branches, one every two and a half branches. When we went back in the fall, post-treatment, in our treatment or our control site, the population doubled, but granted it, it doubled to one per branch. You know, we're still talking really, really low densities. You don't see defoliation at this level at all. Um, but you can see there's a huge drop in the mimic sites when we look at it in this parameter. You know, down to less than you know, 0.1 per branch, one every 10 branches. Uh, if we look at a different, in a different sort of parameter, the percentage of those plots that were positive spread throughout that area. Um, we started off with roughly, you know, between 60 and 70 percent, um, fairly similar between our controls and our treatments. When we went back, it was pretty much the same in our control treatments. It was down to almost 10 percent in our mimics. So. I mean, this isn't a test specifically of the early intervention strategy, but what it does tell us is that not only can we treat and significantly push down these low density populations, we can also detect it in a meaningful way to actually evaluate the strategy in some way. Now, the efficacy is only one part of it. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, as an ecologist, efficacy is not necessarily the most interesting part of it to me. We were also very interested in the non-target effects that we could be having through treating these low density populations. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen this. This is the, the food web for spruce bottom It's one of the things that, the, that was established during the, lab, the previous outbreak with a lot of excruciating um, sampling, the daily sampling of insects and rearing insects through to see what was actually talk, attacking not only spruce bugworm, but to the left and right, also other herbivores that are feeding on spruce and fir trees in that area. So here's spruce bugworm underneath that, uh, that arrow. There are some other little caterpillars on different sides. Some that are closely related to bugworms, some not so much. This layer here are the natural enemies, parasitoids in particular, um, that attack spruce bugworm, but also hold all the other, a lot of the other things that are feeding at the same time as spruce bugworm. Uh, so there's a lot of those. 
Uh, there's a layer above that. These are parasitoids that are called hyperparasitoids that are looking for spruce budworm that have been attacked by these parasitoids. So they're actually looking for these guys. And then we have another layer on top of that of parasitoids that are called hyper hyperparasitoids that are looking for these guys. So this is a really, really complex food web, and this is part of what contributes to keeping that population really low. The other thing we learned with all of these guys is that a lot of these fellows and ladies uh, required multiple hosts throughout the season to actually be able to persist. So there's an added sort of layer of complexity in that if you have low densities of other things earlier in the season that are not available, it's going to influence the availability of these guys. Okay? And that being said, if you have a high density of hyperparasitoids, they're going to diminish the impact or, or the ability of these ones to actually manage through spubble. So the point is just that this is really, really complex and going in there and treating low density populations that are to some extent at least maintained by this complex food web, could we be making the situation work worse by actually going in there and treating these populations? Um, so there's, again, there's two ways that we could do this. We have our collections of not just spruce budworm from all these branches and all of our plots we had. Um, we, we had at least the experimental setup already for it this year. We were collecting from everything that we found from spruce, everything we had from fir, and everything from birch, which was the main hardwood host that we had in that area, to see not only what was a, if we could detect any effects on the herbivores. I don't have data, but we, there was nothing obvious from within just before and after this year. Um, but uh, also if they're affecting the herbivores that could be harboring things important to spruce budworm. The big challenge during the previous outbreak, even in building that food web, was that you had to collect the larvae and you had to rear them through um, to actually get the information on the DNA. Um, some of my colleagues actually taking all the DNA information that they've, they've basically barcoded all of these guys here, and they're taking all that information and they're inserting it into a chip. Uh, I don't know what a chip looks like, but it's basically a tool where you take a larvae that you collect in the field that you've frozen, you mass it, you, you just tear it up into little pieces, or else you blend it up and basically put it on this chip, and it tells you all the different parasitoids that were within that caterpillar. So we're not even rearing anymore. All the stuff we're collecting, we're just basically putting in the freezer right now, and as this chip basically becomes developed, we should be able to identify not only what's in spruce bugworm, but what all these other things are just from using this chip. So that's one of the other parts of this project that's being developed. So that was that was basically the first year of infra, of stuff that we we've, we've been moving forward from. And there's a there's a couple other parts of the project that I, I could talk about. Uh, communication is actually a big one. Um, communicating with the public on the different types of insecticides we have available, and contrasting against things that were done in the past, and have, at least giving the information on that on that conversation. We have a fairly broad. Uh, um, um, a keen communications group, uh, which I'm part of, where we give a lot of talks, and there's, there's sort of some very specific things that we're trying to do to, uh, in the course of this management. Um, I can talk about that later if people are interested. But uh, in terms of the science side of things moving forward, um, there are still things to left to do in the old plots. You know, we, we're going to continue our population sampling. In these areas we treat. These are areas are not going to be treated this year. Um, we would like to know what, how long it takes for these ones that we knock down in these populations to start to reestablish and sort of start meeting or catching up with the other populations if they do. Um, we also like to know whether there's lingering impacts on the other herbivores and things in these different control and treatment sites. Uh, see whether we're, you know, we want to understand the longer term impact on not just the herbivore community but also the natural enemy complexes within those areas. Um, we also have. For better or worse, we have an opportunity to actually test this early intervention strategy. Um, I showed parts of this earlier. We have two of what we would characterize as hot spots. You know, they've reached that threshold at which they can be treated. Um, in uh, two different areas in northern New Brunswick, here you can see the red here. That represents where the outbreak is right now. You can see a little bit of green here. But this is basically at least the closest um, relatively large population. Um, that could be contributing to these, we assume is contributing to these areas rising. Now, so in the, the northwest, this is a really right at the edge in the Horns Gulch area, there's plots that are not on here, roughly here, here, and here, that have about 30 or 40 larvae per branch. Okay, so we're, we're basically, if we put this on the GIS, it basically looks like a wave that's very uh, respectfully uh, 
respecting our borders very well from Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it, at least in, within the New Brunswick borders, you know, we have a few plots that are a little bit over seven, but across the average in this area, we're looking roughly at, you know, our, is, is somewhere around that four larvae per branch threshold. Um, that's what we basically use to delineate this area. This is just drug driven, drawn in PowerPoint. Um, and we have a control, of course, that we would use to compare against that. This is what it actually looks like when we put it on the GIS. Um, there is sort of these plots with these areas. Um, the actual plot probably looks like it, it encapsulates a lot of this area. Again, just like we did with our mimic plots, the very extensive population sampling in these areas so we can understand what's going on with the broader uh, herbivore and, and the natural land community in the control centuries. The other area is up in the Campbellton area. Uh, there's Campbellton there, Quebec is right here. And you can see that, you, well, there you go. Now you can see, this is basically here. This is roughly 12,000 hectares or so. Um, and as we've been sort of, my crew's been up there, there's a lot more points we have in this now. My crew's been up there on snowshoes and skidoos, basically picking up out two branches around the perimeters, trying to make sure that we have the margins of this uh, as we like. And not surprisingly, as is the case in all these sort of management, as we start sampling edges, these margins expand. Uh, so it's probably still, it's still about 12,000 hectares. Um, but uh, that, that's basically what it is. And of course we have our controls uh, either across the border or potentially we have some areas up here that are really <coughs> residential farmer type areas. We might try to select some controls in there as well. We're looking at and then that's what it basically looks like when we are on the GIS. These really dense areas, hot spots, and sort of a broader area that encapsulates that. So it, that, that's really where the project is right now, where uh, some of the main central questions, at least that I'm associated with, that are being built up this year. Um, I put together kind of a very rough slide um, of some of the different types of options of collaboration that we could have with you guys. I mean, Brian and I have been talking about some of these different elements. Um, there are things that can be done collaboratively, there, there can be things that can be done complementary. Um, at the very least, there can be a good dialogue about whether we're having any success or whether um, it's worthwhile for um, some of you to, to consider some of these options. So, of course, this, I encourage everybody to join our citizen science program. Um, as part of, this will be part of both the early detection and trying to understand the parts of the population dynamics we still don't understand very well. Um, L2 monitoring, um, Brian did a great job of uh, soliciting some help from a lot of the, the local uh, groups to actually try to get some L2 densities. We didn't really know very well where Bean was, at least based on the L2 densities he had this year. I, Brian, was there anything above the no. one or two per inch? No, we had 11 in total. Actually. Yeah, 11 total on 100 plots? 100 plots. Yeah, so you guys are still, you, you're still very good. You still don't have very much there. Certainly nothing near any kind of threshold we would talk about at this point. Yeah. Um, Discussion, I mean, as you, guys, as you move forward and make decisions about how you want to strategically manage budworm, maybe we start having conversations about whether you want to do something that, that you know, after this year, providing we have some success this year, whether it's something worthwhile for, that you might like to approach as well. Um, and what, this, is, this is something I threw in there. Uh, my colleague, uh, Veronique Martel um, and uh, Sandy Smith, who you might know, we had talked about alternatives to spruce budworm. They had, there was a pretty broad program using trichogram on minutum. It's an egg parasitoid, which some of you might be familiar with for uh, uh, agricultural systems. It's very effective at low population density, surprisingly. You know, you've got this nice curve where low density populations tend, if they have uh, trichogram minutum, tend to be attacked. So this could be something that could be deployed um, in a couple of different ways. We, we don't understand whether it would work or, or how to use it yet. Um, effectively, but it's certainly they produce a pile of it and they use it very effectively in agriculture. Um, so that could be something that um, could uh, be approached. Uh, we like the idea of the biological control. We've also talked about it, how it could potentially be deployed as a part of a citizen science program again, for people who want to manage their woodlots and to see if we can get some success on that. Um, and of course there's all sorts of ecological questions that you know, we, we, we don't have the time uh, but I have lots of interest to, to sort of talk about. We talked to some people in Maine, Brian put us in contact with uh, talking about bird surveys, and not surprised, I was gonna talk to you, I had a couple people from Environment Canada down in Sackville who said, hey, do you wanna do some bird surveys? So we're starting, to, <laughs> apparently a lot of people wanna do bird surveys, because of course, birds are linked to these population uh, cycles of budworm as well, you know, that could be an important part of their cycle, um, if we start thinking about some of the, the, the importance as a, as a disturbance agent. Um, there's lot, always information on population dynamic, dynamics. I mean, 
I, I would point out, and I think a lot of people have pointed this in the past, when we talk about our understanding of population dynamics, we have, you know, the, the original stuff by Tom Rayama and um, R.F. Morris was based to a large extent on four plots in only New Brunswick. And there's a lot of room uh, throughout the range of Spruce Quad Farm for different sort of processes to uh, take place that we would love to know about. Um, there are also some really interesting southern range climate change uh, potential questions that we would love to address. You know, looking at uh, is spruce butter is an envelope type of population where it's with climate change things start shifting north. There are some, pen I have my colleague Deepa is looking at things in the north. It's probably farther north than we've ever detected it, at least right now. It's actually outbreaking in black spruce plantations way, way, way up in Quebec right now. You know, this is in sort of in an unprecedented way, and she's got work that's all sort of, with all sorts of interesting interactions. There's probably some interesting southern range work to be done as well. Those are just some ideas. I, there's lots of things that can be worked on in this, and I, my, me and my group are more than happy to uh, collaborate with some of these projects. So this is uh, part, part of my group, most of my group anyways. Um, they're working with me, a couple postdocs, and uh, lots of uh, employees and some grad students in there as well. Um, my management is very supportive of uh, the work that we do, and I, I do, I would like to acknowledge them because I do appreciate having good management. Um, they're also very encouraging for any collaborations that I've ever tried to set up. 